Are you tired of foreign armies trying to occupy your country, rolling through, damaging all the grass? You need to get yourself a brand new Hyundai K2 Black Panther main battle tank. Yes sir, Hua! This bad boy is guaranteed to stop the North Korean army at your gates or those Russian tanks trying to stroll in through Poland, all while boosting your nation's economy. But wait, there's more! In this episode, we're gonna take a deep dive into South Korea's tank history, the series of decisions that led them to produce their very own homemade tank, the thinking behind its design choices, and why the Polish military plans to buy almost 1,000s of these tanks and even license their own version. There's a reason Poland's president attended the arrival ceremony of the first batch of 180 K2 tanks purchased from South Korea. Gdańsk is a port city on the Baltic Sea coast in the northernmost part of Poland where the South Korean tanks arrived as part of a $15 billion mega deal signed just five months ago. This made it one of the fastest fulfillments of a heavy arms contract in history. It solidifies Korea's reputation as a reliable source of NATO compatible weapon systems. Their manufacturing process is so fast they should just have a drive through window for NATO members. Can I have 556 five, magazines with that? Military analysts around the world have noticed that South Korea has been quietly growing from a basic consumer of US munitions to one of the world's biggest weapon suppliers. But it hasn't always been this way. In June of 1950, when North Korea invaded the South using T-34Ss, the South Koreans had no armor of their own, so they quickly got cornered and almost thrown into the sea. To stop the government from falling, a US-led coalition of UN forces rushed to the field with American M24 Chaffee light tanks from available stockpiles in nearby Japanese bases. And while the Chaffee was useful for infantry support, it couldn't stand up to the iconic iconic Soviet T-34. As we know, the Korean War eventually reached a stalemate and an armistice was declared in 1953, splitting the peninsula along the now infamous Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ. No peace treaty was ever signed, resulting in the two countries still technically at war today. South Korea never forgot how their country came within a hair's length of being destroyed, and their lack of tanks was one of the major reasons for this. With the North having a fanatical, bitter army and the South picking up the pieces, trying to rebuild, and still reliant on American munitions because they couldn't even produce these themselves. Things were getting tense. Imagine living next door to a crazy looking neighbor who's sharpening an axe while giving you the evil eye. South Korea needed to rectify their over-reliance on US weapons, but it wouldn't happen overnight. And this brings us to the origins of the K-1 tanks development in the early 1970s. Hey you! Yes, you. What are you doing carrying around that giant rifle, you dummy? You should be equipped with the next generation tiny goat gun technology. Just put one in the back of your next Zoom call meeting and see what happens. Now, if you take a look at slide seven. One second, this is Jeff from accounting. Is that a goat gun in the background? Oh, that old thing? That's just my goat gun. I didn't know you were cool. I love guns too. Uh, are we best friends now? The ladies love them. The hunky boys love them. And there are dozens of different styles to choose from. Wow, thanks. These miniature one-third scale die-cast metal replicas with dummy rounds are exactly what I needed. Each goat gun has working replica bolts, tiny fake magazines that you can load dummy rounds into. These hefty little suckers weigh up to 16 ounces and range from 4 to 15 inches in length. They're meticulously crafted with high levels of detail, making them the perfect gift for your friend or family member. Goat guns come in build kits with parts that snap or screw together easily. They make the perfect display piece for any desk or shelf. Bro, I didn't know you were also into AR-15s with an M203 grenade launcher and EOTech sight. You're probably a cool guy and not even a little bit socially awkward like I originally thought. Yeah, totally. Thanks for noticing, man. Click the link in the description below to get your goat gun today. Seoul received a sobering intelligence report stating that the North Korean army was in the process of locally producing Soviet T-62 tanks. The news could not have come at a worse time for the South Korean government because that was exactly the time when the US 7th Infantry Division began to pull out of South Korea under the Nixon Doctrine. Nixon stated that the United States would assist in the defense and development of allies and friends but would not undertake all the defense of the free nations of the world. And so South Korean government rang the alarm bells and started making every possible attempt to get their hands on the M60A1 patent. But they weren't having much luck and no amount of pretty please seemed to get them enough M60s to gain a significant advantage. In response, the United States transferred numerous variants of refurbished M48 patent tanks from Vietnam that were still slightly worn but serviceable. However, the South Korean president Park Chung-hee was understandably concerned about making maintaining the balance of power on the peninsula and their over-reliance on foreign arms for self-defense. 
So along with upgrade kits for the M48 Patton, he also allowed to send engineers to the United States Army Depot in Alabama to gain knowledge in armor cast steel welding, precision manufacturing, assembly, quality inspection, and test evaluation. However, just two years into the process, in 1976, satellite images confirmed the existence of the T-62 tank factory inside of North Korea. These intelligence reports had warned about them prior. The news put even more pressure on the president and the entire nation of South Korea to industrialize. And the story says that President Park personally summoned the chairman of South Korea's largest conglomerate to start planning the construction of a brand new tank factory. Fun fact, because the words for tank and train are so similar in Korea, the businessman walked out of the meeting promising the South Korean president that he would have his train factory. Fortunately, his secretary was paying attention so the misunderstanding was quickly resolved as he was leaving the building. By this point, it was clear that upgrading their existing M48 patents was a half measure. So South Korea began to consider the long game, which was the production of a modern Korean tank, with Chrysler Defense as their first choice. However, the company clearly didn't understand Seoul's intent because it suggested an outdated design, the M60A3, be produced domestically. This prompted the start of secret talks with West Germany to receive technical assistance from Krauss Maffei the company responsible for the Leopard 1 design. The talks to make a unique tank design were kept secret because the two countries thought that if the information got out, the US would step in. And by absolute coincidence, in 1977, Chrysler Defense found an opportunity to make a little extra from the development of the M1 Abrams. This time, Chrysler offered a new tank based on the newest M1. Eventually, an executive contract was signed on December 1st, 1978 to supply two prototypes. Enter the next phase of this relationship. The following two years saw a lot of legal agreements between the two nations, mostly regarding intellectual property rights and royalty payments. For example, the United States provided its state-of-the-art special armor plate, identical to the M1 Abrams, while limiting Korean access to 44 key parts and installation processes for security reasons. In addition, exporting this South Korean tank required authorization from the US and the payment of royalties to Chrysler Defense, so it was basically the same as when my dad let me in the garage to help out out, but didn't let me touch anything. It was a trade-off from South Korea, who got the benefit for millions of dollars of US DOD research as long as they limited their involvement. The irony is that the name of the prototypes to development were called ROKID, or Republic of Korea Indigenous Tank, but the relationship kept them dependent on Chrysler, because it precluded Korean engineers from most of the design and production of the tank and they didn't understand the structure and technology. During the production of the prototypes, Chrysler Defense was sold to General Dynamics Land Systems in March of 1982. A total of two row kit prototypes were produced and sent to trials at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds to be tested against American military standards. Once there, the Aberdeen facility revealed the prototype had significant teething problems. For example, the engine could not climb a slope of 60 degrees and caught fire on one of the tests, while the firepower test rig reported issues with its fire control system. Like a shaky line of sights in winter conditions, interference from electromagnetic waves, and lockup of the ballistics computer. Eventually, the known problems were fixed and improved by the time of the delivery of the two prototypes. In the end, GDLS transferred the PV-1 along with 1,300 pages of blueprints that we ultimately found insufficient for indigenous manufacturing in South Korea. The result was the South Korean XK-1, a prototype that bore such an uncanny resemblance to the larger American tank that US troops stationed in Korea nicknamed it the Baby Abrams. Oh, look at it, your beautiful eyes. Who's gonna slay the enemies? You are. You are. In spite of this, men who work together with power tools will always brag and show off. So although the contract limited technological access, engineers from both nations freely shared information during friendly interactions around the water cooler, including classified specifications. When the upper management of Chrysler found out about this, they built a wall in the office and required the South Korean engineers only walk along specified lines to prevent information leaks. However, this proved to be too little too late, and the Koreans managed to obtain significant data to understand how to build their own tank factory and reverse engineer most of the parts that they needed. In 1987, the General Dynamics K-1 could dish out some serious hurt. However, South Korea owned very little of the technology behind it. Almost 80% of the components came from other countries. 
Moreover, consensus arose among the defense industry, including politicians, the military, and developers, who viewed the K-1 tanks as a humiliation, because the tank would not exist if South Korea had sufficient technologies. It was a matter of national pride for South Korea to have the ability to design and build a tank, and the arguments went beyond national pride. Developers claimed that during times of war, military logistics and support could stop when geopolitics came into play, as witnessed in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. With all their gained knowledge, South Korea wanted to pursue a policy of self-reliance and the ability to step to the other side of the equation and capitalize on their ingenuity. Still, the K-1A1 was still an American design that fell under the United States export control and intellectual rights, which were a burden for exporting. Mass production and new R&D was the next step. However, it didn't start until the early 1990s because of the austerity measures on the country and the military refused to incur in cost overruns. Instead, South Korea decided to upgrade the K-1. By 1997, a significant number of K-1s had been built and South Korea was getting ready to start developing the next evolution of the K-series. But the Asian financial crisis interfered with their plans. The Agency for Defense Development, which is South Korea's equivalent of DARPA, first came into existence. And let me tell you, the folks at ADD have no problem focusing. They were determined to develop a completely indigenous weapon system that would perfectly fit all of their needs. They took the time to analyze the lessons from war and understood what they really needed. You see, unlike in the Second World War, where the tank proved to be a decisive weapon, the mountainous, heavy, forested, and muddy terrain prevalent to South Korea often prevented large masses of tanks from maneuvering, and no tank developed for large European planes would make a near-perfect fit for their needs. Thus, the development of a completely indigenous tank began in 1995 at a cost of $260 million. In the end, South Korea designed a tank that, on paper, appeared to be at least equal to, if not better than, the specifications of contemporary NATO tanks. To achieve this, the South Koreans looked all over the world for inspiration, technology, and know-how, and they combined all of them into a formidable machine that was distinctly Korean. In other words, if the French Leclerc tank and the German Leopard 2 tank ever had a love child, the result would be the K2, and its custody would be disputed in front of Judge Judy between the US, Swedes, Israelis, and the Brits. Korean developers created a dream team, inviting experts from around the world, including Sven Berg, Philip Lett, Israeli Tal, Aishi Awawa, and Richard Agorkowitz to give 40-hour seminars to confirm the assurance of main battle tank development. All presentations were recorded per agreement and used for understanding systems development of the tank. Furthermore, seven researchers from the Agency for Defense Development, ADD, who were responsible for designing the tank, were sent to the United Kingdom for a year of tank development education. The result was the Black Panther. No, not that Black Panther. Not that Black Panther either. Nope, not that Black Panther also. Now I know what you're thinking, but Chris, why name it the Black Panther? That sounds more like a superhero than a tank. Well, the name Black Panther was chosen for a few reasons. First, the tank doctrine is intended to make it as agile as a panther. Second, the tank's speed and maneuverability made it as deadly as a panther. And third, let's be real, the name Black Panther sounds way cooler than Korean tank number two. But what about the manufacturing industry? In the same way the Japanese relied on Mitsubishi heavy industries to produce their T90, and Type 10 main battle tanks, the South Koreans turned to Hyundai Rotem, an affiliate of the Hyundai Mortar Group, to provide improved performance in the 21st century network battle environment through improved ergonomics and digitization. Yes, the Black Panther is a Hyundai, but a mean Hyundai. You might think it needs a drip pan, but the Koreans will tell you, that's not a leak, my Hyundai's just marking its territory. It really is more than a Hyundai, because Rotem is collaborating with Samsung, Techwin, Kia, and other renowned Korean companies to produce a world-class tank. And unlike like other arms producers, they actually have robust production capabilities to mass produce their indigenous tanks in incredible numbers without relying on third countries or things like semiconductors. Remember, South Korea is the world's second largest chip manufacturer after Taiwan. The K-2 Black Panther carries a three-man crew consisting of a commander, gunner, and driver protected by NBC capability, inertial navigation, and GPS battlefield management systems networked with identification friend or foe. The panoramic sights of the gunner and commander are stabilized in two axes, including a thermal imager and laser rangefinder, allowing for day and night observation to improve situational awareness. And to top it off, the cabin is fitted with an air conditioning system and an interface that allows the tank to be operated by just two or one crewman. So that means a Korean version of Fury with a K-pop soundtrack isn't out of the question. For its main cabin, 
Japan and South Korea developed the L55, its own version of German Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore gun, which is a full 1.3 meters longer than the 120mm L44 caliber gun used on all Abrams tanks and older Leopard 2s. With a longer gun comes greater internal pressure, so the L55 gun has superior muzzle velocity. Munitions. In terms of armaments, the Black Panther has a range of standard heat and tungsten core Sabo rounds, some of which are reportedly capable of penetrating even the most modern of armors. In addition, it has its own unique round of its own, the Korean Smart Top Attack Munition, which we'll cover later on in the video. South Korea developed its own autoloader, compatible with all NATO standard tank rounds. Shells are loaded from the back of the turret via a machine gun-like belt, which can ensure the loading of projectiles on the move, including when on uneven surfaces, allowing it to fire 10 to 15 rounds a minute. If rounds are continuously fired, not accounting for target acquisition, reacquisition, and lazing. But the K2 isn't just a brute force machine. It's also got serious smarts. It has a sophisticated fire control system and an automatic target tracking system, so it can hit targets with great accuracy and precision. It's like having a tank with a PhD in ballistics. The tank's fire control system is a technology transfer from Francis Thales, so it's likely again using some Leclerc inspired technology. As an advanced fire control system, it is highly automated, so even South Korea's conscript crews can learn it quickly. A similar philosophy to the German Leopard. Likewise, once a target is acquired, the gun and turret can automatically track it without further human intervention. Although the heart of the tank is its gun, the next most important component is its engine and transmission, collectively known as the power pack. For this, South Korea again looked to Germany and its excellent MTU 890V12 diesel 1500 horsepower Euro power pack. Unfortunately, making an equivalent in indigenous produced engine turned out to be a harder nut to crack, and it took Seoul seven years to finally reverse engineer an acceptable equivalent. The South Korean engine has slightly worse acceleration versus the MTU, zero to 19 miles per hour or 32 kilometers per hour in nearly eight seconds, up from seven seconds in the German model. The first 100 K2Ss produced had MTU engines and successive batches sport Korean engines. However, the new diesel engine can run at a maximum speed of 40 3 miles per hour, 70 kilometers per hour, has a range of 267 miles or 430 kilometers, and generates an impressive 1500 horsepower that can push a 55 ton tank or pull 34 Toyota Camrys. In terms of armor, the K2 most likely has a classified composite blend ceramic armor package inspired by the British Chobham and developed by Samsung Composite Technology, as well as explosive reactive armor. Clearly, that doesn't say much, but what we do know is that the front has been tested to withstand a close range Sabo shot from the K2's own L55 high velocity gun. There's speculation that the front can provide protection against large caliber armor piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo rounds, while the side armor is limited to medium caliber armor piercing spin stabilized kinetic energy projectiles. Also, the ammunition compartment is equipped with a blow off panel that protects the crew against the explosion of the ammunition. So, no jack in the box or cook off exploding turret effects on this autoloader. In other good news for K2 crews, the agency for Events Development Product Improvement Program announced in June 2021 that an active protection system would be installed in the main battle tank to improve its protection against anti-tank rockets and missiles with soft and hard kill features. Only time will tell how it compares to the trophy system, that or maybe another leak to win an argument on a Wargaming Thunder forum. Now, despite all of these foreign influences on the Korean tank, there are some homemade innovations. The most noticeable is the tank's hybrid suspension, which distributes hydro-pneumatic systems systems and torsion bars alternatively placed between the wheels. Originally developed for the K1, an improved version allows the K2 to lower or raise its profile like a low riding streetcar. You know, so you don't have to climb out of a tank just to pick up a memento from a vanquished enemy. Stabilization auto target detection and tracking is one more trick. The auto target detection and tracking system is a feature aided by millimeter band radar in conjunction with the fire control system. Because although South Korea didn't invent millimeter band radar, its integration and application are unique. So given Korea's mountainous and uneven terrain, there will always be a danger of sudden bumps knocking out the aim, so the radar predicts uneven terrain and will slightly delay a fire command just long enough so that the gun can realign with the target and fire. Among all the Black Panther innovations, the K-STAM or Korean Smart Top Attack Munition is my personal favorite. It has its own guidance system, aided by four stabilization fins, and once fired, it will reacquire the target and the final 
final stage, deploy a parachute to slow its fall and accurately engage it with a molten projectile into the thin top of an enemy vehicle. So if a K2 operator tells you he will make it rain fire from the sky, you might want to take it seriously and take several steps back. This is a good reason for the development of the Korean Smart Top Attack Munition. With plenty of hills, there are lots of little valleys for enemy tanks to hide in. The K2 uses its suspension to almost sit and unlike its German or Israeli counterparts, elevate its gun to a near mortar-like angle to indirectly fire the top attack round. So despite being one of the most expensive main battle tanks in the world, Hyundai Rotom, the manufacturer of the K2, hasn't stopped receiving orders for its world-class Black Panther. Not only because it's a great tank, but also because of the philosophy behind South Korea's defense industry. They built this tank with completely indigenous technology, which allows them to share and transfer their product. This is why Poland chose it as its main battle tank by licensing the technology to build their own variant named the K2PL. One thing is for sure, South Korea's Agency for Defense Development has proven uh, its R&D capabilities are strong enough to stay ahead of the rest of the major players, and its decision to build NATO-compatible systems along with a strong military-industrial complex signaled that the Asian country will be a player to watch in the coming decades. So what do you think? Let me know your thoughts on the role of the K2 Black Panther. Do you agree or disagree with the points I've made? I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. I'm your average infantryman and host, Chris Cappy. Follow me on Instagram at Cappy Army, and make sure you check out our other videos while you're here. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you soon.